In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. St. Jude, glorious apostle, faithful servant, and friend of Jesus, the name of the traitor has caused you to be forgotten by many. But the church honors and invokes you universally as the patron of difficult and desperate cases. Pray for me, who am in need of God's mercy. Make use, I implore you, of that particular privilege accorded to you to bring visible and speedy help where help was almost despaired of. Come to my assistance in this great need that I may receive the consolation and help of heaven in all my necessities, tribulations, and sufferings particularly. And that I may praise God with you and all the elect throughout all eternity. I promise you, O blessed Jude, to be ever mindful of this great favor. I will honor you as my special and powerful patron and encourage devotion to you. St. Jude, pray for us and for all who honor and invoke thy aid. Amen. If I but touch his clothes, I shall be cured. Because of our cultural distance from first century Judaism, we can easily miss that the stories in today's gospel are not just about healing and raising from the dead. The woman with the hemorrhage and the daughter of Jairus are two encounters with ritual impurity. The woman with the hemorrhage is herself ritually impure, but it's also the case that anything she touches also becomes impure. And one of the worst forms of impurity, the kind that needs the longest form of cleansing in order to become pure again, is the impurity that comes from touching a dead body. And Jesus reaches out and takes the dead girl by the hand. Now we should note that being ritually unclean wasn't really a moral problem. For most people, ritual impurity wasn't a big deal. You need it to be ritually pure in order to worship in the temple. But for someone in Galilee, that probably only happened one to three times a year. On those feasts, you would show up in Jerusalem a full week early, go through all the purifications, and then be pure for celebrating the feast in the temple. Some of the Jewish sects at the time, however, were pushing that one should always be ritually pure. Or at least the leaders of these groups should be ritually pure. And of course, the priests needed to be ritually pure if they were going to do their job in the temple. And eke, eat the sacred portion of food, allot it to them. So there's probably an expectation that if Jesus is this great leader, a prophet, or the Messiah, then at least he should remain always ritually pure. But when Jesus comes in contact with the impure, something miraculous happens. Instead of becoming impure himself, whatever he touches is purified and healed. Because he's not just a great leader or a prophet. He is God incarnate.
We, however, are not really concerned with ritual purity, but with something much deeper. Our concern is a moral purity. It is the impurity and distortion of sin. And Jesus can cleanse us of our impurities as well. There is no stain, no fault or failing, no event in our past that can keep us from Jesus Christ. Nothing that renders us unable to approach him. Nothing that he cannot heal. But we want that purity to be not be a temporary state that lasts until I get half a block away from the confessional. We want it to be habitual. We want it to be a virtue, a perfection in the moral life of a mature adult and actually be something we love. We encounter the divine purity of Mary in the singleness of her heart. All of her focus was and remains on the Lord whom she loved. We lose that. We lose the direction of our heart and give it to someone or something that is not worthy of it. Or we drown our hearts in the indulgence of our own pleasures. That singularity of heart that constitutes chastity and purity will certainly look different for one who is single, for one who is married, and for one who is celibate for the sake of the kingdom. But Mary virgin and mother remains a model for us all. If we want that purity in our lives, especially in the midst of this world, it's going to take a lot of practice and possibly a very long time. we need to first make sure that we never despair of the virtue of purity taking hold in our hearts. Even as the woman of the gospel suffered 12 years and finds new hope in Jesus Christ, we need to remember that as impossible as purity may seem for me, nothing is impossible for God. We also need to make sure that We're not engaging in the things that lead to that impurity. Seriously, if you want to put a fire out, you have to stop throwing fuel on it. There's enough in our culture that is just physically impossible to avoid. We need to avoid adding to that. And we need to go to extra lengths if we find ourselves constantly falling into sin. And then we need to go beyond the external. Which is important, but we need to get to that reordering of our hearts. We need to meditate on just how twisted and depraved so much of that impurity is. What a horrible thing it is for us to use others for our gratification. What a grievous injustice it is to our spouse or to our future spouse and certainly to our Lord. And then we need to cultivate our devotion rightly to find that divine purity that we see in Mary. Focusing our love where it is meant to be forsaking any bare pursuit of 
pleasure and living a life of service and sacrifice for the good of the beloved. Finally, when we face temptation against purity, we actually should not try to fight or struggle. The more we struggle with those kinds of temptations, the stronger they tend to get. I'm not going to do it actually only makes things worse. And the further you push the boundaries, the stronger the current becomes. The real solution instead is to run away. Run to Jesus and the proper devotion of your heart. Or really run to anything, anything that can distract us and get our mind off of it is helpful. If I but touch his clothes, I shall be cured. If I but confess my sins, I shall be forgiven. If I but partake of his body and blood, I shall have eternal life. Purifying our hearts that they might have that singleness for the Lord in accord with our state in life is possible because He is the source of all purity. And our Blessed Mother desires nothing more than to lead you in that purity to her Son. As we seek to imitate her divine purity, may we never hesitate to draw close to Christ who can purify, heal, and give life to all who trust in him. And so let us conclude with our novena prayer to the Virgin Mary. O Immaculate Virgin Mary, Mother of Mercy, you are the refuge of sinners, the health of the sick, and the comfort of the afflicted. You know my wants, my troubles, and my sufferings. By your appearance at the Grotto of Lourdes, you made it a privileged sanctuary where your favors are given to people streaming to it from the whole world. Over the years, countless sufferers have obtained the cure for their infirmities, whether of soul, mind, or body. Therefore, I come to you with St. Jude as my patron to implore your motherly intercession. Obtain, O loving mother, the grant of my requests. Through gratitude for your favors, I will endeavor to imitate your virtues that I may one day share in your glory. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.